Hey guys, let's talk about HEMOC here. So it's a very high yield system. Of course, all systems are high yield. So what you really need to know is hemoglobin synthesis. So what's the big player in the blood, right? So every day you get a CBC and what are those four things you look at? Let's correlate this, all right? White blood cell. We got our platelet. We got our hemoglobin and our hematocrit, right? So let's dive into this guy, right? What is up with hemoglobin? So maybe how it's created would be important, which it is. So what's the rate limiting step in biochem? That's what you must know. So, you know, what disorders can totally inhibit or limit or mess up hemoglobin synthesis? Lead poisoning, AIP, acute intermittent porphyria, and porphyria cutanea. So this will have the cutaneous one, right? What can regulate, you know, heme. If you have too much, you're probably going to inhibit this, right? Glucose, how does that affect it? All these things you'll have to find out, okay? Here is a uh, an image I took from a book, clearly, right? So we talked about glucose and heme. That is what we call inhibiting. Um, heme, if there's too much heme, it will negative feedback inhibition. You should know that from undergrad. Glucose inhibits it. But the real question is, what is this step? And this is uh, amino levulinate synthase, right? So say ALA synthase, all right? So that's what glucose and heme inhibit. But look, what are the players? So they'll ask you this on step one. You need to know glycine, succinyl-CoA, and vitamin B6, pyridoxine, are the players. You must know those three. You must, okay? So look where lead poisoning acts, all right? So lead poisoning, uh, dehydratase, and where is it? Ferrochelase. So ferrochelatase. Lead poisoning messes up both of those. So in that case, porphyrin, porphyrin, and ALA, porphyrin will be increased, right? All right, you guys got that. So the big players, right, you got glycine, succinyl-CoA, vitamin B6. Those are the rate limiting steps. That's what you must know. When lead comes in and messes things up, we got the ALA dehydratase here, inhibits it, and furochilase. Sideroblastic anemia is X-linked, and it in interferes here. You could, it could be caused from a vitamin B6 deficiency somewhere in this, uh, we'll say, somewhere here is being messed up, hence why it's shaded, this region is sideroblastic, okay? So let's keep moving on. Notice how there's so many points to this one slide. I could just stay on here. So AIP, right, inhibits the deaminase. Porphyria cutanea tarda is the decarboxylase. We'll talk about those later. By later, I mean pretty soon. So let's go on down here. So here we go. We talked about lead. So AIP, the deaminase, okay? This was the old name, uroporphyrinogen. I'm not even going to go there. But you need to know it's the deaminase. And the fun, interesting thing about this is you'll see it on your psych shelf because it, they always have depression. And they always have this abdominal pain and some kind of neuropathy or nerve pain. So this will be seen. I guarantee you, you'll see it on your psych shelf. And you'll probably see it here, but if only you knew that it was this important to know because nobody is stressing it, but I am now. So let's talk about cutanea tarda. So this is decarboxylase, right? Different. So you accumulate porphyrin. This is uroporphyrin, but we just saw above that this is what you'll get, right? I guess that is what you get, uroporphyrin. But it's number three. You just got to recognize it's uroporphyrin, all right? The interesting thing about this one is they'll have photosensitive skin. That will be a dead giveaway. And their urine will be tea colored. Dead giveaway. So I bolded the dead giveaways. So when you go through a vignette, you'll be able to know what these clues are. Because all a vignette is is a series of sentences with strategic things in there to guide you to your diagnosis. All right? And we said these are the big players. Rate limiting step. All right, overview again. I'm just not going to beat it down. So let's talk now about hematopoietic synthesis because you got to start from point A, you got to go to point B. So when you're a baby, that should be an S there, yolk sac, right? So three to eight weeks, yolk sac. You know, they'll usually say, what about seven weeks? You know, eight weeks, the answer is liver. What about later on, 20 weeks, we'll say second trimester, spleen, okay? This will be one question. Just know those three. ABO and RH, so pregnant women at 28 weeks, they get something called ROGAM. If they are RH negative, which means their red blood cells don't have antibodies to RH factor. So ROGAM is also known as, we'll say it's anti-D. 
So um, this is super high yield. They may have a question on this for step one. It's mainly step two. But what you need to know is uh, usually you give Rogam to a mother who's RH negative at the time of birth or within 72 hours or at 28 weeks. Or not or, but and at 28 weeks. So RH positive means you have RH on your cells and you don't have the antibodies. Okay. So the big thing to know is from this slide, IgM does not cross the placenta. IgG does. When mom has been exposed to an RH positive baby, the first time it will create an IgM antibody, but it's not a big deal because it cannot cross the placenta. The second time around, it will create a uh, IgG, and that sucker can cross the placenta. And that can cause hemolytic anemia, and that's where you get this erythroblastosis fetalis. No estabi in there. No estabi. All right, let's keep going. Let's talk about the kinin pathway. So what you need to know is this guy named Calicrin normally is inhibited by C1 esterase inhibitors, okay? So this is right here. Normally inhibits calcarin, all right? So if you have a low C1 esterase inhibitor, you'll probably have increased calcarin. People with uh, low C1 esterase inhibitors may have an increased predisposition for angioedema, just things to know. So all other things you should know from this is bradykinin. What does it cause? And you know, for step one, you need to know pain. And you may say, Lewis, what about vasodilation and increased vascular permeability? Literally any other inflammation factor I feel like causes that. So what's unique? Pain. Know this. All right. Interestingly, calcarin, right, is a serine protease. Make sure you know this. High yield facts. All right. That's two points. Platelet cascade, right? So how does it happen? So there's injury, endothelial damage. And then the little, we'll say the tube or vessel, will vasoconstrict. Vasoconstriction will release endothelin from the endothelial cells, all right? Now we have this little damaged area. This damaged area leaves an area that's exposed, and the exposed areas where von Willebrand factor can bind this collagen. So I whoop, bind the collagen. And Weibel Pilati bodies of the endothelial cells and alpha granules of the platelets are the ones who can make von Willebrand fractor, okay? So you need to know where is it made. They love to say Weibobalade, and where in particular alpha granules. Super high yield. Let's keep going on. So you got your injury, your you know your exposure, and now you get adhesion. Things start to bind. This is not my image. This is taken from online, so I'm not taking uh, credibility for it. But what you need to know is a platelet binds von Willebrand factor. So when you have low platelets or low von Willebrand factor you'll have increased bleeding time. So how does this happen? It's between a linker called GP1B. When you have low GP1B, you have bernard Soulier syndrome. All right, when this binding occurs like this, whoosh, we get a conformational activational change. And this change now says, hey, platelet, you can release all of this ADP, calcium, TXA2. All right, and these things promote more aggregation and better binding. So this new ADP, can then bind to this area called P2Y12, which I wish I knew, right? You know why? Because this is a question you're going to get. All right, you need to know this guy, right? So why do you need to know this guy? Platelet inhibitors, target it, all right? So you'll be asked this for sure. You need to know which one it is. It's P2Y12, all right, guaranteed. Must know it. All right, I digress. So ADP binds P2Y12, and then this will induce expression of G2B or 3A. So the, remember, the way I remember this is 2B to not to be. So it's always 2B. All right, then the other one's 3A. So when you get uh, thrombocytopenia, autoimmune induced, you got these, this is what an antibody looks like, right? So we got an antibody right on down here to our 2B, 3A, all right? That is a problem, and they're gonna ask you, you know, they, this platelet, this patient has low antibodies, 33-year-old female. They, what They found an autoantibody to what? Boom. I'll draw it again. Autoantibody to this. It looks like a broom. Okay? Not stress this enough. We're almost hitting the 10-minute mark, so I'm going to do one last slide here. And then if you want more of this, more access to this, send me a direct message on um, Instagram. Email me at theusmlecoach at gmail.com. Visit my website. Hop on the chat. Um, basically what I'm doing is I'm taking slides of huge concepts and telling you exactly what you know 
what you need to know and what you should have known. All right, silence my phone here. So platelet aggregation, this is it. We got 10 seconds here. So what happens? Fibrinogen will then bind these 2B, 3A, right? We talked about this. This is where those antibodies will bind. All right, and what links them? What promotes this, right? So promotes this, TXAT. What is anti-nitric oxide? All right, and prostaglandins. So I thought this would be a good time to talk about nitric oxide, right? So here's nitric oxide. And what's interesting is everyone chooses cyclic AMP on everything. This one is actually the pathway leads to guanylate cyclase, and this will lead to this guy, which is cyclic GMP is part of the process with nitric oxide, all right? So when you have this initial aggregation here, um, what you need to know is that initial aggregation isn't a tight binding, so it leads to an unstable clot. And then this is like, you know, they're like this, and then you need to weave it together somehow, all right? And sorry, when I said PG12 uh, or E, whatever, it's PGI. So PGI2 is right here, and this uh, does not promote aggregation. It will lead to bleeding. So let's integrate this slightly with farm. So how does aspirin work? It's irreversible, one and two, okay? Clobidogrel, boom. This is what I was talking about. Guaranteed you'll be asked this. I would bet millions of dollars on this. Millions of dollars. Okay? Nobody told me that. How about this? Nobody told me about this guy. I'm just giving away what I wish I had known. And that's why my students are doing really, really well. My goal is to level this playing field because I love Hemonk and I wish I knew this better. What's interesting about this drug right here? MAB stands for monoclonal antibody. Okay? So... Boom, monoclonal antibody to this guy will lead to the same thing as autoimmune-induced thrombocytopenia. All right. All right, I'm stopping there. I hope you all had a great time. I know you got a lot of impact out of this, and I know you can get even more. This is just part one. I'm on slide 12 of 128, so there's probably about another hour and a half to this. And I hope you have a wonderful day. And if you like this, comment below. Please subscribe. And uh, keep me motivated. So if you're doing well in school because of us, send me a message. If you want a study plan, message us. And honestly, you deserve to have a great day and a great life. So there's no reason why you shouldn't have access to this. So have a wonderful day. Remember, you can do anything. There's nothing you can't do as long as you have an above average work ethic.